Thank you all for being here, first of all, and welcome. My name is Sam, and I am the group CEO of Venager, which since last year, November 22, is part of the Adaptivist Group, very proudly. For anyone that doesn't know the Adaptivist Group, anyone that knows Script Runner, we're the makers of Script Runner. Now, I'll give you an overview about what I'll be speaking today. First of all, I'll tell you a bit about us, about Venature, about the Adaptivist Group. Then I'll get into what Ronald would have talked about, about what the play on, what play on is about, and a bit about the Embracer Group overall. Then we'll move on to the initial situation where we started together with play on, and what the challenges were that they were facing. And then we will move on to how we solved those challenges, or tried to, we didn't try, we did solve them, by implementing Jira with the power of the rest of the Atlassian tool stack that has already been used within the company. And we will also talk about what our role in all of this was. And we'll finish off the session with a small Q&A round. I hope I can answer all of the questions in, in representation for Ronald, but I'm sure we will be able to get to a good result here. Now, let's talk about us, right? For anyone that doesn't know us yet. So about the group, we're an official Atlassian Platinum and Enterprise Solution Partner, uh, helping various organizations around the globe. We're specialized in cloud, agile at scale, ITSM, and soon work management. Now about us, we have over, it says 800, but we by now have passed 900 employees across the organization in more than 15 countries and over 20 nationalities and spoken languages within our organization. Now this is pretty important to us because we want to represent a diversified community, companies all over the world, languages spoken all over the world, people working in all, of, uh, in all different places. We have people in Australia working for us, Kuala Lumpur, North America, some South America, although we don't have an entity there yet, but we're working on it, and across Europe and South Africa. Now, here are some of the key events around when Venture was founded. Back in 2016, both myself and Alex, who's sitting in the audience, we thought, I, we've had a vast amount of experience around the Atlassian ecosystem uh, whilst we were working for Deutsche Telekom. And we were thinking, hey, why don't we bundle the knowledge that we have and support organizations with our skill set? So we were looking for a place to set up, and unfortunately, there weren't any garages left, so we used an old antique shop that actually Alex used to live in the back of. So we have quite a bit of a unique story there with our antique shop. Today, we still have one of our offices in that antique shop. It looks different, but it, it still has that feeling, right? Across a couple of years, we were able to achieve certain goals within, within the past six years as an Atlassian partner, and we're very happy and proud about it. The proudest moment, obviously, is the acquisition by the Adaptivist Group, where we've joined and partnered up the group uh, as of November 2022. Now let's get into what and who play on this. Now, the Embracer group includes various game developers and publishers. And one of its biggest brands is Play On. Now, the Embracer group has a total of over 16,000 employees worldwide and a total of more than 25 million Swedish kron which uh, is approximately 24 million US dollars in revenue. Now, PlayOn is part of the Embracer Group and has over 31 offices worldwide with more than 2,400 employees. PlayOn was founded in 1994 as Koch Media. So the person that founded it had the surname Koch and that's essentially the meaning is chef. A cooking chef, right? So Koch Media grew, and across that, uh, in the beginning, there were just, a, not just, but a distribution of um, a company that distributed software. <laughs> Over the years when they grew, 
they, they founded a video game publishing division named Deep Silver. Now after that, other divisions in the field were added and video games followed. Very successful video games like Dead Island that I had mentioned or Saints Row. Now Ronald is actually not here today because their, their release for their new title game, Dead Island has been pulled forward and it's being released as of tomorrow. In 2018, Koch Media became part of the Embracer Group through an acquisition by Embracer. Now, in the course of the following years, further successful games were launched on the market. And also, when we look at it, in August, I believe, of last year, also the rights of, on Lord of the Rings became part of the group. In addition, also Koch Media has started acquiring other companies, such as Solar Media and Voxler, as well as, as, well as founding other successful labels themselves. In 2022, Koch Media went through a rebranding and was named PlayOn. And this is now their new logo as of last year. That was launched at Gamescom, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, of last year. Anyone that doesn't know Gamescom, Gamescom is a big, big trade fair around video gaming that is actually hosted in our hometown, Cologne. That's just a coincidence. <laughs> Now, what was the initial situation that PlayOn was facing? The product management I'm talking about. They had problems they wanted to have solved, right? And they were looking at, okay, how, how can we have these problems tackled and who can help us? They were researching, thinking about it. COVID hit. And Ronald and his team said, okay, we need to start rethinking the way we work. We need to transition through a transformation of the way we work within our product management because it becomes more and more complex. Now, in the last three years alone, the product management team has developed strongly. They grew. The number of team members grew by 60% with more than 100 projects managed by that team. And in addition to two new management levels, these required a much higher level of transparency and reporting, especially since they become part of the Embracer group. Reportings became more important and they needed to know at any time and any place what was going on and what the process was and the progress of a new game title that is being released. Now, in addition to all of this, an increased number of projects and reporting requirements and all of the new platforms that we've seen, like PS4, PS5, all of those Xbox platforms, Steam, Epic, Luna, you name it, we all know them. There are so many various video game platforms that needed to be nurtured and fed. Those just increased the complexity for product management because they needed to make sure that those were all fed in the process. Now, the different tasks that arise in the product management areas is divided into three areas, physical, digital, and technical. Now, with the physical one, you all probably can think of what it is. It's everything that can be uh, touched in connection to a purchase of a game. Now, whether it is the file carriers or the disk that we're talking about, or maybe it's some games are published on a USB stick, which I don't believe, but merchandise or collector's editions. Those are all taken care of by PlayOn and the product management right there. Now, I've got my Hogwarts Legacy one because I have a collector's edition. No, I did not get it from PlayOn. I actually bought it because I'm a big Harry Potter fan. Now, anyone that didn't play it, this is not an ad, but it's really cool if you ever want to experience Hogwarts. And then there is the digital part of it. Now the digital part means there are tasks in the digital area of the publication on the various platforms that we know, whether it is Steam, the PlayStation Store, or Xbox Store, or any other online store where it can be published. And last but not least, the technical part of it. 
which is mainly around game development, certifications. When we talk about certifications, this is also the age restriction certifications that we're talking about. And these need to be handled. And if that is something that is not being managed properly and it's delayed, it can delay the whole release of, an, uh, of a title in a certain market. And when, when we think about it, a, a title is not being launched just in one market, but in multiple markets globally. And that all needs to be managed by the team. Now, all, it may mean that some of these tasks apply because PlayOn is taking care of just the physical distribution or maybe just the digital dis distribution or just the technical or all three of them. Now, managing all three at once just increases the complexity once again that we just spoke about. Now, when we look at the internal interfaces at Play on, we see that the product management is the center of the network here. And they collaborate and work with creative services, brand marketing, the developers, first party, the quality assurance, but also digital commerce. So even video game trailers and all of those things are done in brand and marketing. It doesn't mean that all of them are always involved on every title. But if all three of the task areas that we showed you before are involved, then all these need to, be, need to interact with one another. And this complexity with that, even when we think it's a small selection, it's not that many interactions. There is a lot of detail that goes into one game to be published. Now, when we just remember that complexity uh, in that network that we've just seen, we know that this is where that initial situation has derived from. They don't really have a good overview of their tasks because those, were those tasks were filed in silos based on projects. You don't want to know how they were working, and I'm not going to tell you until we get to that point. But tasks were not very comprehensible due to the lack of the clear structures within the organizations the status and the responsibility of tasks. Essentially, this goes back to transparency, right? The team didn't know who was working with what because the tooling that they were using was, frankly, almost non-existent. And I asked them, how did you guys survive all these years? Well, they've done it somehow. A lot of manual work, a lot of inefficiency. And this was exactly what they wanted to transform in, right? When you're thinking of it, this is a Hey, this, is, th this company comes from the gaming industry and you're thinking, hey, this can't be. They must be using the state-of-the-art technologies. But when we think of it, only when COVID hit, tools like Teams were introduced. So that's in 2020, just very recently. So due to no tool-based help, they were using, for example, Excel, as an existing tool, although it was not made for it. They were planning the projects in it, dependencies and tasks. Now imagine one person opening a file, another person opening the file, and then inconsistency in the data that is being um, yeah, taken with them along the journey uh, the, of a release of a title. Now, a lot of communication is necessary, and due to that lack of transparency that I was just talking about, they needed to even speak more to each other. And when COVID hit, that became a bit more difficult because they didn't have proper tooling to do that. And Teams was just introduced and the clear documentation was missing. Now, during the execution of a project, requirements were always changing. And how were you tracking these ch changes in an Excel sheet? Did everyone have the same same uh, information status? No. There are people that had old information status, people that pulled copies of the Excel, uh, Excel files and that continued working with those Excel files. And you have to think about in a title release, they the people would pull a copy and take it to the end. And at the very end, when they're releasing the title, they actually realize, oh my God, we've taken that mistake with us all along the journey of the release of the title. And that can, not just cause inefficiency, but cost a lot of money too. 
They had no standardized structures available around these processes of changes. And this makes it difficult to establish reportings too. Now, if you look at this initial situation here, you can see that something should change with the current growth that they are experiencing. And PlayOn has recognized this and has taken the necessary steps with management sponsorships. Because management sponsorship in this type of transformation is very important. That change that we're going through without management buy-in will be difficult to achieve the best results that we need. And we stepped in together with our customer in order to help play on, conquer and be successful in this transformation. Now, we get to the interesting part, implementing JIRA. What were the core requirements? I mean, the requirements were obviously not just these four points, but they, they made up the core structure of it. Now, first of all, single source of truth. No one that just pulls a copy and says, this is what we need to do. All tasks are in one place, data management in one place, accessible to everyone at any time, and no redundancy. Clarity, an overview of all projects, when they are supposed to start and when they're supposed to be released. If a release of a title like Dead Island is pulled a week forward, it changes the whole project scope, right? Just like they did now. With the help of Jira, they can actually now uh, do that very easily. <laughs> now, the digitalization helped map processes and approvals that were needed in a completely digital way. Yes. They had the possibility to do it through emails before, or sometimes through phone calls, if I remember correctly. But now they're able to track those approvals properly through JIRA. And now, OK, these approvals that were necessary are here, and we can continue the work. And if they're not here, we know who to go to in order to, uh, to, to uh, move forward in the process. Security. Restricting access to individuals for specific issue types and to keep information secure. I mean, as you know, some, some game titles that are being released uh, have sensitive information. They have, um, they have the previews of the games, the trailers, and all of those things that are not supposed to be published before the date that has been agreed on. And for that, it means that only the, the group that is supposed to have access to this file actually has this. And this can be done very well through roles and permissions in JIRA. Now, what were the goals that we had that we wanted to achieve through these requirements? We wanted a simple onboarding. When we talk about simple onboarding, we're talking about a possibility to have proper documentation and have processes documented and a standard set so that every project has a certain set of standards on how it's being executed. Reporting. Findings can be better documented and viewed across departments with the help of JIRA and automated reports that are generated from it. Structured workflows. We want tra traceable paths and uniform templates. Because, I mean, there are hundreds of projects, new projects being launched, and we don't want those projects to always have a different template. We want a standard across the organization for various types of tasks that we have that we just talked about. And those templates can then be used to also make easy reporting possible and have those uniform structures that the management is looking for. And essentially, we have clear responsibilities. The delegation is enabled between the title, distribution, and epics based on the appropriate workforce and expertise. Before, 
New team members joined the team. They didn't know what the process is. It was intransparent. Whose responsibility is this? I mean, an organization with 2,400 people distributed across the world in 31 offices. How am I supposed to know that when I just joined the product team, right? Now, why Jira? Wasn't there maybe another tool they could have used? Well, first of all, collaboration. Some other departments were already working with Jira, but it was just a small set of, uh, of teams. And the organization said, why should we be using a different platform when we have a great tool like Jira? But they weren't educated about the full power that Jira actually had, Jira software we're talking about here. And they knew that the collaborative functions they had with Confluence around documentation that they could have would actually pay into it. So Jira was quite a good candidate for it. Information and communication. They wanted to move away from email communication and communication essentially through Excel files where they make comments to a cell that you don't really see. You need to see that corner that is filled out to go hover over it, read the comment, take your reading glasses out to even read it because I can't even read them to be honest because they're so small on the screen. And having a tool that has the information presented in an agile manner for tasks that are accessible to all really helped making an easy decision for JIRA. Essentially, we were able to break up all those silos within the organization and encourage collaboration between all departments. Now, obviously, every organization is different and personalization obviously pays into it. We saw that we can customize workflows and requirements according to the needs of PlayOn and the onboarding of other departments with different requirements will also be easier because now the platform Jira is being used and product management is just the first step. PlayOn is looking at also onboarding the other teams and departments onto it and making them use the full value that Jira could actually add to their business. And essentially that pays into the last point, scalability. You can scale it across all departments and have, it, uh, have a possibility to easily add new consoles that are released because we have PS4 and PS5 today. Tomorrow there's PS6. And then there is a new marketplace that maybe PlayStation is launching one day. You'll be able to actually scale and adopt to it accordingly. Now, let's have a look at that solution approach here that product management had, right? Now, product management is pulling, uh, is using product management templates over and over again to pull the standard tasks for each project. Now, in that, all titles exist in parallel without the need to create a new project for each title. <clears throat> in the product management templates, there are single tasks inside it with details and descriptions and backgrounds that are documented in Confluence. Now, task templates include, um, task templates and short in, uh, descriptions are included with a link to the Confluence knowledge base as a database to help them identify individual tasks in the larger process, such as the first party certification. That is a specific certification amongst them. Now, the project module actually contain all projects, and in addition, it has custom tasks. And it takes the standardized tasks from the templates module as well. So some standardized tasks could be get the uh, rating approval, right? Or create the, um, what's it called? The, 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 uh, the, uh, the trailer, the game trailer, that's, that's the word I was looking for. I had it in my head in German, but yeah. Now, essentially, this is a learning process. Game titles change, uh, platforms change, and it's an iterative process where the documentation is then updated from the experience of current projects that might need some adjustments. 
New tasks are derived from, uh, from templates and added to the module. Now, how were we of help to play on? Why did they need our assistance? Why didn't they do it themselves? Well, we added value through various points in this process. And this wasn't anything that we did within three months. It was a process of over 18 months when we initially launched the first, first version that was being used by, by the product management productively. Requirement workshops. Together with the customer, the requirements were recorded and analyzed. And they were questioned by us. We bring our expertise and experience from various projects that we've, we've, um, that we've uh, fulfilled in the past. And we present possible solutions. It doesn't mean that we present one solution, but we think about presenting options of taking an approach to this solution. And we make recommendations which way to go. But essentially, it's up to the customer as to what they decide to do, right? Now, we drew up network plans. In this step, we have shown the dependencies of individual processes in this step. This is also made and it affected all stakeholders known and it allowed them to be involved in this change process. Now, when you, believe it or not, when it first was drawn up, the customer then just realized, okay, how complex certain processes are. And management understood, okay, we really need to change something here. Consulting and implementation. Now, we have completed the implementation based on best practices but we also developed new structures for the customer that were specific. Now, the use of best practices is very important. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. There is someone that had a similar issue, a problem that they were facing and needed a solution for. And those best practices are a point that we can jump off when we need to make certain adjustments to a certain degree. Now, from this point on, we make individualizations that could be carried out that would add a value to them. Many requirements were covered according to the Pareto principle. It doesn't necessarily mean that a requirement that a customer has needs to be fulfilled 100% in the way that they were expecting it to be fulfilled, but we need to also show them what is possible and what are the possibilities of Jira software in the cloud? And how can we work differently as opposed to, let's say, 10, 15 years ago? Because often customers ask us to, hey, this is the process today. I want this to be digitalized. Can we do this this way on Jira? But sometimes it doesn't make sense because we have automations that can take care of a lot of tasks. And that is something that people need to get their head around. Because that change means you have to change the way you work. And how do we convince management to buy into that? A very important aspect of this are POCs. The creation of POCs are essential. Why is that? We prove the feasibility with the creation of a proof of concept. These proof of concepts then build the ground for stakeholders as well as decision makers to convince themselves of the functionality and the possible scale through that tooling and change. And last but not least, there are trainings. Now, these trainings are very important because it's not just an implementation that we've done of the solution, because there is far more to it. We're changing the way the people work and we need to, we need to uh, be, be there along the journey. We need to support the customer throughout that journey. We need to support the product management team and the trainings of their people in the way they work. It's a change that they go through, a change of the way they work. 
And that is why trainings are very essential to that overall change in order to drive acceptance for the new way of working and to nourish that. If we wouldn't have trainings, it would maybe mean that people would not be using the tool. So that investment that we've made is actually not something that is giving us a return, which is something we don't want, right? Now, we're not just, in those trainings, we're not just talking about how the tool is being used, but how the way of working is being changed, essentially. Now, overall, we know that during this process, we've been able to help play on and the product management change the way they work using the Atlassian platform. And there are many more departments to come that we're currently speaking to, to adopt them onto the platform and change the way they're working too, together with their product management. Now this brings us to a small Q&A session for anyone that has questions that I can answer. Any questions? Don't be shy. No? That means we can have an early break if there are no questions. <laughs> yes, please. Sorry, again? Uh, you had a correlation between epics and the documentation. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, give me a second. I'll move back and maybe Till can give us some more insight to it. Uh, Javier, can you pass on to Till just to make sure that we're... You mean here, right? So basically when you're um, looking into the EPIC topic and the connected documentation and you see the EPICs with the help of creation, file arrow, right? You mean this? Um, so basically in Confluence and the documentation you have written down the notes of how you solve those tasks and what you have to do basically like a roadmap or a runbook so basically everyone can start working on that um, without having any big training again on how to solve those tasks, right? All right, then I'd like to thank everyone uh, and enjoy the rest of Team 23.